Our scripture today comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, from the Common English Bible. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, They don't have any wine. Jesus replied, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. His mother told the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby there were six stone water jars used for Jewish cleansing rituals, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with some water. And they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some from them and take them to the head waiter. And they did. The head waiter tasted the water that had now become wine. And he didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom and said, everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second rate wine only when the guests are drinking freely. You kept the good wine until now. This was the first miraculous sign that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. When Maggie and I were married, our reception was in the basement of the Canton Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in Northeast Missouri. We were married in the small town where we'd met our freshman year in college, at a disciple school no less. We had cake, and my Auntie Hazel had come in from Virginia, and she made finger sandwiches and a lot of other delectables. There were mints. There was even fruit and ginger ale punch. But there was no wine. In the ancient world, weddings were community affairs. The whole town showed up. There was no need for engraved invitations, and apparently there was wine. Scholar Gilberto Ruiz suggests that the miracle centers on wine because abundant wine is symbolic of God's presence in the world. The idea that wine is something more than it appears in the plain meaning of the text for today makes a lot of sense to me. Because the Gospel of John is just brimming with metaphor and symbolism. The last Gospel written, John can be both confusing and challenging because of the various layers of meaning. So it's tempting, it's tempting to read it non-critically. But that can be very dangerous. It can lead down a dark path. At its best, John has been misused to turn Christ's message of inclusive, expansive love into litmus tests or exclusion. At its worst, John has been misused to justify anti-Semitism and even the Holocaust. The fourth gospel was also written in a particular context, in a particular time and place. It was written to Jewish Christians in the midst of an internal conflict within the local synagogue. And so in the coming weeks, as we journey through the gospel, we need to be very conscious and careful as we hear John's disdain for, quote, the Jews. We need to be careful that that, that bitterness is, we realize that that bitterness is about a particular situation rather than the Jewish faith as a whole. So hold that caution as we work through John until Easter. Back to the story about the wedding at Cana itself. If we're careful to avoid the pitfalls, we can find good news in John's symbols and metaphors. 
Though we often refer to the turning of water into wine as a miracle, and I suppose it was, that's not what God, that's not what John calls it. John refers to this as the first sign. There are seven that John identifies. For John, a sign points to who Jesus is. So the question is, what can we learn about the nature of Jesus from this scripture? After calling the twelve, Jesus and the disciples shuffle on off to Cana for a wedding. The setting of the wedding at a wedding is significant, writes New Testament scholar Carolyn Lewis. Weddings are normal events of human life. Jesus introduces the presence of God into the day-to-dayness of being human. They are a celebration of relationship and held the promise of new life and festivity. I like that. I like the poetry of Jesus beginning his ministry at home. In, while, albeit he was in Galilee, but he wasn't in his own hometown. He was in Cana instead. He begins his ministry in John at a typical, ordinary kind of event. An ancient wedding might last a week. It was important that there be enough wine for the guests throughout the celebration. For the bridegroom, whose responsibility it was to offer hospitality, to run out would have been mortifying. He would experience great shame in the community. The mother of Jesus, John never names Mary, notice that the wine is out first, and she tells Jesus. Now, to our 21st century ears, Jesus' response Well, it seems a little harsh, a little petulant. From Scripture, Jesus replied, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. Now, every single scholarly source I consulted this week, including the Women's Bible Commentary, said this would not be heard as it is heard to us in the 21st century. Says Newsom, Ring, and Lapsley, His words are not an act of rudeness to his mother, but are an important assertion of Jesus' freedom from all human control. When encountering women in John, this is how Jesus would typically refer to them when he spoke to them. The text just puts Mary at the same level of other women. Now, is it rude to treat your mother the same way as other women? Perhaps, but I think, but I think it's more of a literary device here than it is an actual reflection of their relationship. John uses Mary to set up what is to come next. Mary responds to Jesus by telling the servants, "Do whatever he tells you." And so she she didn't seem to hear it that way either. Mary responds by saying. Do whatever he tells you. She reflects utter confidence in her son's divine origins. Now, though this is the first time Mary shows up in John, her faith in the special origins of Jesus are completely consistent with the way she was portrayed by Matthew. You might recall that we discussed that before Christmas when we were looking at the Magnificat. Even more than Matthew... John is concerned about showing the divine origins of Jesus. And so Jesus proceeds to instruct the servants to fill up six 30-gallon stone jars with water, which, of course, becomes wine when the head waiter tastes it. Now, the dangerous and flawed interpretation of these stone jars is one that has been used to hate our Jewish siblings through the millennia. In this anti-Semitic interpretation, the stone jars used for purification rituals by Jews represent Judaism. When Jesus turns the water into wine, so goes this problematic interpretation, he is replacing Judaism. This is the sin of supersessionism. Supersessionism is the idea that Jesus replaces Judaism. Now remember that term, because there's going to be a quiz in a few minutes. 
Given that Jesus himself was a devout Jew, and that his critique of religious leaders in all of the Gospels was consistent with the internal culture of debating within the faith, this is a really hard thing to argue logically. It's a real stretch, and yet that's what Christianity has done. It hasn't stopped us from doing so for, the, for millennia. This is an example of taking the easy way. On the surface, it's an easy interpretation given John's bitterness against the Jews, or what he calls the Jews. Remember, however, that it had to do with an internal squabble at the local synagogue. John's subset of Jews have separated from the other Jews, from other Jews. John is now defining his, Jew, his group of Jesus followers, of Christians, against those people, people with whom he's angry. Okay, here's the pop quiz. What's the sin of supersessionism? That's right. It's the idea that Jesus came to replace Judaism. It is about defining ourselves against another faith, and it is anti-Semitic, and it is hateful, and it is dangerous, and it is not loving our neighbor. Now remember that term, because it's not just some historical sin that we can just say, well, that was in the past. It is an insidious virus that continues to infect the good news that Christ brings into the world. It is present today. Now, if I were honest, I'd like to just gloss right over the stone jars and pretend there was no meaning there. But they obviously symbolize something for John, or they wouldn't be there. Writes John, nearby were six stone water jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. So let's look at this a different way. Let's, let's try another interpretation. What if the jars do indeed represent Judaism, but the wine which is created within them, and it's created within them because water goes in, wine comes out. So sometime within the jars, wine is created. So what if the jars do indeed represent Judaism, but the wine which is created within them and which Gilberto Ruiz said are symbolic of God's presence in the world, is not a replacement, but an expansion of God's love in the world. Consider, faithful Jews follow the teachings of the Torah. The Torah, which Jesus was quoting when he told us to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. From Leviticus in Torah, in, in the Old Testament, you must not take revenge nor hold a grudge. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It is within Judaism, represented by the stone pots, where faithful people learn and practice love and justice. It is the faith where the good wine of God's presence emerges. This means that God is not satisfied with only Jews living in relationship with God. God is about to do a new thing through Jesus. As the good wine is poured out, the good news expands to people who have not yet responded to God. This is good news. God works to be in relationship and be present with us, whoever we are. God seeks out everyone, but not just with a one-size-fits-all religion. God's expansive love for humanity means that there are multiple paths to the divine. For some, their journey is within Judaism or another faith. But for many of us, for me, it is through Jesus. We don't have to hate our Jewish, Buddhist, or Muslim neighbors to follow Jesus. In fact, that's the opposite of loving our neighbor. That's the opposite of what Jesus taught. We don't have to define our faith against another faith. We don't have to mirror the anger that John felt when he wrote his gospel. 
we can choose to recommit today to the path that God has laid before us. We can commit to our Rabbi Jesus, the teacher who modeled and taught a way of radical love and hope. And we can, in that commitment, we can commit to loving our neighbors and recognizing that there's more than one path to the divine because that's loving our neighbor. Amen.